Hey, Marianne, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. Oh, it's good. That audio, I wanted to do my, my computer's doing something weird. <laughs> can you hear me? I can. Okay. Welcome to the uh, first edition of the uh, uh, Violent Professionals webinar. I'm doing these on Sunday evenings at uh, 7 o'clock, and uh, yeah, this is the first session, so it might take a little bit to get people to join in, but um, but yeah, I hope it's a good place for anybody that's you know a string professional to come on and hang out and have good discussion. So somebody else is here as well. I'm going to um, go ahead and put them into the um, video as well here. Yeah, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Michael Sanchez, and I'm a violin instructor in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I've um, been playing violin for 28 years. I've been teaching for about 12 years. I've uh, written a book on how to play the violin, uh, the four dummy books, uh, Fiddle for Dummies. I <clears throat> have expertise in both uh, teaching violin and fiddle. I um, really enjoy you know, teaching either of those. So yeah, uh, Marianne, um, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Oh, you're muted. Uh, name is Marianne Pricko. I, I thought my headphones were working. Something's going on with the computer. Um, I've been playing uh, since I was nine years old, <laughs> so over 50 years ago. And uh, originally, I, I had some lessons in classical violin. Most of my training is classical. And about maybe 20 years ago, something like that, I was invited to play for a fiddle group. So I started learning some fiddle tunes and got into that. Uh, actually left it for a while, then I moved to Pennsylvania from Michigan. I grew up in Michigan and in Pennsylvania, I joined the Butler Symphony, which is a semi-professional orchestra. Most of the people there are professionals. Uh, although my profession is teaching psychology, this music has always been kind of my first love. I just never really did much of a profession in it. Um, I did teach a couple people there, but I'm really still a newbie for as a teacher, and I think I'd like to do more of that. Um, so I moved to Nashville two years ago, and here the music jamming uh, is old time, so I thought I, I needed to learn old time styles. So I'm kind of focusing on that at the moment. I'm trying to learn from people who have field recordings. There are places here where you can get, where you can find those, where you can buy them. So I'm trying to learn kind of the original style. I still sound very classical. So it took me, I think, two or three years to get rid of the vibrato. <laughs> I couldn't stop it. So there's still some issues, but um, I've learned a lot about fiddling. But most of my training is classical in the past. I actually totally relate to you on that. Um, you know, being that uh, I've been classically trained, I yeah, I would say it's it's not easy to switch over into that fiddle style because there's so many things that are, are different about it. So, yeah, most, you know, really good fiddle players that hear us play, for, for sure me, I know, um, will we'll definitely – be like, yep, he's he's a classical violinist playing fiddle. <laughs> so, um, you know, it takes a little bit of adjusting to learn some of those things. But, um, but yeah, it's fun, you know, just playing the tunes and um, learning, you know, some of the things. And you're definitely in a great place to be able to, to improve on all that, obviously, in Nashville. I, I actually lived down in Nashville for, um, for three years. I don't know if you know where uh, Laverne is, Laverne, Tennessee. Yes, I did. Yep, so that's about uh, 20 minutes south, and um, I moved down there uh, actually with my with my country band. Um, I was with a, a band here in Grand Rapids when I was about 21, and uh, the story is they called a, a violin shop that I was actually working at, and they were looking for a fiddle player. So at the time, I didn't I didn't play any fiddle, and um, I basically didn't even know like what would be different about playing fiddle or violin, and and yeah, I just I really enjoyed joining them and kind of learning how to do the country fiddle style. So I became their fiddle player and moved down to Nashville. Um, and then I actually joined um, um, working at a, a, a violin shop down there in Nashville, Nashville Violins. I don't know if you're familiar with them. The violin shop? Yeah, it's, 
Uh, well, there's the violin shop. That's what it's called down there. But it's uh, this shop is actually Nashville Violins is what the shop is called. Okay. So I work I work down there for for about two years because yeah, it's kind of hard to make it as a as a musician <laughs> down there. That's why. Making... Yeah, that's why I didn't. And I was never very good at practicing anyway. So. <laughs> yep. That was always an issue. I got lazy. Sure. Yeah, but the scene down the scene down there is just is awesome. And um, you know, anybody that's wanting to, you know, be around music, that's the place to be. And uh, I did it for three years and then I got a gig out west um at the Medoro musical. I don't know if you've heard of that. Hmm. But um but yeah, that that's a really um kind of, you know, Gig that most people out this way at East Side don't know about, but it's um, it's basically um, a show every single night for 94 nights in a row in the summer, every single summer. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like two hours of playing every single night, the same exact gig. And um, it's like I joke about it. It's like kind of like the movie Groundhog's Day. It's like the same day every single day, and you don't know like what day it is. <laughs> you're doing the same thing every day. So I actually kind of got sick of performing um, and came back to Grand Rapids and started teaching full time after that. That's kind of my story. So, yeah, hey, uh, it looks like we have another joiner here. Uh, Joyce, how you doing? Let me unmute you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes, I sure Hi. can. How are you? <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks for joining us. This is our first session, and um, you know, it might take a little bit to get get people here, but uh, I'm glad that you came. Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm here in Akron, Ohio, and I teach privately. Uh, I have about 50 students. Oh, wow. Excellent. And it's just really nice to sit in your house and people come and give you money to talk about what you love most in the whole world. <laughs> That's right. When you're passionate about teaching, it's fun. It doesn't even feel like work, right? Absolutely. That's awesome. Akron, Ohio. Very cool. So you teach all levels, um, mostly just violin or some fiddle or, or what do you Violin mostly? and viola. Violin and viola, okay. Yeah, all levels. Okay, great. And How long have you been teaching? Teaching since about uh, high school. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's 40 years. <laughs> you guys both got me by quite a while of teaching and playing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. I've so, been playing 52 years. 52, okay. That's right around Mary Ann's time. That's about the same for me, yeah. I used to live just two hours east of Akron in Clarion, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. A small little town. An interstate 80. A Pennsylvania person. Not anymore. I'm in Nashville now. Ah, uh, I was born in Pennsylvania. I was born in Detroit. Catanning. Yay. <laughs> Uh-huh. So, uh, Joyce, do you do any online teaching as well or just in person? No, I only teach in person. Okay. And then have you just kind of uh, built up your studio based on referrals and stuff like that? Or do you... Um, uh... I, have a, I have a website. Okay. I, I plan to retire eventually here, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. Websites are kind of expensive to maintain. Sure. <laughs> Sounds like you're busy, though. Uh, 50 students is a lot. So you're probably doing mostly every day of the week, then, I'm guessing? Six days. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Great. You do you, what uh, you love. You never have to work for a living. Yep. Do you, uh, do you hold recitals, like, a couple times a year or just once? or? I have a – over the summer, I, I invite my students to play in a chamber orchestra – that I lead and that kind of works pretty well. So we, we, okay. we play all summer and then at the end of the summer we have a big concert and a uh, reception afterward and, and it, uh, it seems to do, do the trick. They go nice. back to school not having lost anything. Nice. You seem like you'd be, yeah, you're a pretty cool teacher, I can just tell. <laughs> <laughs> probably inspire your students and uh, probably enjoy lessons. I love it. Yeah, they do. Excellent. They, they're, they're great. They're great. I have all ages, all the way up into the 70s. Oh, wow. Cool. 
<laughs> yeah, it's going to teach students that are just starting up up in that range, you know, because they're they're like retired and you know they want to have something fun to do and have a hobby and help them out with that, you know. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. <laughs> and in that orchestra, there are ages eight to seventy-two. Wow. Okay. <laughs> nice. So you probably help them with yeah with their music that they bring to you and stuff like that. Absolutely. Neat. Marianne, do you uh? you have all ages? I know you, you do more of the um, psychology online, but do you teach all ages with that, or is it mostly a certain age group? Well, since it's online, uh, there are all ages. We have had people in their 70s and 80s. Um, most of our students tend to be older students because it's online, and a lot of them have three or four jobs, family, and they, and they go to school full time, so they're overloaded. And sometimes we get a lot of people in the military, people overseas that can't go to a college elsewhere. So yeah, it's, you know, I, I really love teaching it. I, I teach various psychology classes, including their first class. These are master's students. And uh, uh, educational psychology, human development, and a remedial writing class. <laughs> Neat. Isn't it just cool how you can touch so many people online and just, you know, people you never would be able to teach otherwise, you know? What's Neat. nice about online teaching is that I can do it at any time of the day or night. Um, we write, mostly write discussions, not too much of it is live, and then uh, I can just go online when it's convenient, so it's, it's wonderful <clears throat> that way. And technology has really come a long way. I mean, you can do all this stuff like now on your phone and, you know, it's like, you know, five years ago, it was so much more challenging to, to be an online teacher, but now it's really come a long ways, you know? Yeah. So most people have a decent internet connection and, you know, have the ability to hop on pretty easily. And yeah. They even have office hours every week. What's that? They even have office hours every week. So that's kind of cool. Oh, okay. Neat. Thank you. Get me live on the phone. Nice. Hey, Howard. How you doing? I remember you from a couple of years ago. Uh, you were on a webinar with me or something. I, I remember we've had some, some conversations. How you been? Oh, I've been okay. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I was on a I was on a webinar that you gave, and I was the only one that came. I think. I think so. Yeah. We, we still had a good discussion. I remember that. And um, I, I remember you, yeah, coming on, and you're a violin teacher. Uh, yeah, I just saw your email uh, a couple of minutes ago, and I thought I'd hop on and see if you were still uh, d having your uh, meeting. Yeah, I'm doing these. Uh, you know, it's probably take a little while to catch on, but um, basically every Sunday night at 7, I'm going to um, host these. Uh, basically, yeah, for any anybody out there that's a string professional teacher um, enthusiast, you know, um, that teaches or whatever. So, yeah, um, you guys can plan on that. So glad you uh, came on board. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, how, uh, how are you doing with teaching? Are you teaching quite a few students now or what types? Of I only have one student at the current time. Okay. And I haven't uh, really gone to a lot of effort to get any more students. Um, I guess one thing that's holding me back is I do have a full-time job that has nothing to do with music, but I still like it and it pays well and it's very challenging. Um, it's, the uh, music, the student I, I, I have basically just is something that um, oh, keeps me motivated, I guess. There you go. Yeah, I remember you mentioning some different things you were doing with technology. Um, remind me on some of that stuff that you were doing. Oh, I, I write software for flight simulators. Um, right. It's real time. Uh, I've, I've been a programmer for a little over 40 years now, and I'm getting ready to retire. Now, once I do retire, I would like to move to some area close to a middle school that has a very active uh, orchestra program and maybe even get my teaching certificate uh, not so much for the money but to um, do something I like doing. Neat. 
So how's your how's your one student doing? Is uh, he or she progressing pretty well? Yeah, uh, she is a very bright young lady. Um, she I think she's fourteen now, and uh, I just took her to her first recital a couple of weeks ago. We went to a a nursing home and played a couple of duets, and then she played a couple of uh, unaccompanied solos, and they loved it. Uh, I, I told her they would, but yeah, she was she was basically uh, shaking like a leaf. And um, I think once she got over the fact that okay, you can play in public and you don't die, then uh, <clears throat> it, it it got a whole lot better. I like to uh, to to take her out to to show off what she's done a little bit more often, I, I think that playing in public is a very important part of taking violin lessons. Sure is. That's the whole musicality part of things. You know, you have your, your very technical students, you know, that kind of just sit in their basements and want to improve. And, you know, the thing with that is it's, it's great to do all the fundamentals and all the techniques and master the instrument. But, you know, those type of students tend to not really play out and, and perform. So it's always going to encourage those students. So yeah, that's great. Um, now she's a little bit more um, more avid to do it again, right? I hope so. Uh, what I really like to do is kind of branch out a little bit. I like to find another violinist and a cello player, and maybe a violist, and and um, organize a a uh, quartet that we could meet and practice once once a week and in the lobby of a nursing home or something. Uh, I know that the kids would, would, like, would enjoy that and the folks in the nursing home, uh, nursing homes are great for that sort of thing. Uh, the average occupant of a, or resident of a nursing home never sees an outside visitor I mean, that's, that's roughly 50% of the population of a nursing home never, ever gets a visitor from outside. And so that, that sort of thing makes for a really appreciative audience. Uh, now, when I, I first signed on here a couple of minutes ago, uh, Mary Ann was talking about doing lessons um, over the Internet, and I, I guess I – uh, missed some of the important part of the thing. I'd like to hear more about that. I'm not teaching violin over the internet right now. Um, I'm teaching psychology classes and educational psychology classes and writing. But, you know, I, I like the idea of teaching online, teaching violin or fiddle online. Okay, I, 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 okay, I guess I missed the, that uh, thing. I, I actually do some teaching over the internet, but not violin. I've always found the internet to be a little bit limiting for that sort of thing. And I just, <clears throat> when I'm teaching my students, you know, back when I had several students as well as now, I always like to get up close and watch things really closely and walk around the student and, and um, observe things like posture and fingering positions and things like that. Uh, some of my students really got kind of nervous about it at first, but I think that they, they finally figured out what I was trying to do. I was trying to really, really uh, be an active participant in their learning and figure out what their problems were. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons I've always had good luck with students is that um, whenever I have a student in my studio, they are my only focus. Uh, that that until from the time they get there to the time they leave, that's the only thing that I'm focusing on is how to help them with with their playing. It's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I actually just wrote on um, the Violin Guild um, one of my opinions on online teaching versus private teaching, and um, I think private teaching obviously you you have the ability like what you're saying to go around the student and do different things like for example i really like to have my arm out here um to kind of restrict the student from coming out if they're really using a lot of shoulder and the, the stroke um or for example i like to really sort of emphasize the student bending the wrist more if they're you know having a really stiff wrist going back and forth bowing 
So, I mean, like actually in person, it's so much better to be able to do that. Um, so those are sort of the disadvantages, I would say. But now with the way that online is, I mean, you can see people so clearly and, you know, put them in a position to be able to see everything they're doing. And as long as you're a good instructor to be able to explain like what's important and what should what they should be doing, what they're not doing, um, it's it's really effective. But I, I, I give it an evaluation of like eight out of 10, in my opinion, I have, as far as effectiveness compared to private lessons. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you look at it um, also from the perspective that, you know, there's people out in the middle of nowhere that don't have teachers or good instruction, it, it can sort of be a better um, uh, alternative because, you know, having a, a decent teacher that's, you know, able to help them um, is, is big. I mean, because, yeah, like I, I talk to so many people throughout the day and a lot of them, you know, they just don't have any teaching anywhere nearby them, you know, so it's really a great thing that they can do. So that's, that's sort of what I really like about it. I was at the uh, class last Tuesday, the, I don't know, it was a beginners. And I was quite impressed. Everybody was like showing their bow hold, you know, like yeah. right here, how well you could see the, the bow holds. I mean, there are things you couldn't see, like if, you know, if the, if the violin disappeared off here, you couldn't see their hand position, but yep. it was impressive how much you could see. Everybody was showing their hands and their bow holds. That was a lot of fun critiquing like 50 bow holds at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I was like, all right, all right, A, B, C, D, E, okay, yep, no, 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 yep, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. One of the things that um, my student is having trouble with, and then we work on it every week, but uh, her her pinky, she she does this thing where this, this knuckle right here uh, goes straight, and I'm trying to discourage that because it, it, you know, you put enough strain on the pinky often enough, long enough, you eventually damage it. And I would really hate for her to have to quit because her finger hurt. Uh, I mean, she's going to quit playing the violin. It needs to be because she found something else that more interesting to do, not because she can't. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to deal with, um, you know, students with certain disabilities or challenges like that. I mean, I notice a lot of students at times, like they have a really short pinky and that's challenging to work with that, you know, with their fourth fingers, um, different things like that. Um, you know, where well, pinky is not that short. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've worked with various different things on the hand position basically saying, okay, the neck needs to go down here, not up here or get it, you know, get everything is, as tall as you can and come down on the fingertips. And I don't know. It, it, um, I guess I just have to keep working on that. It, it's something that um, I really don't want that to be the limiting factor for her progression. Joyce, any, uh, any thoughts? Uh, do you have some students that sort of have some challenges with, uh, with keys or other things? <clears throat> well, the problem is when you're teaching them, you see them once a week. And then they go home and they practice however they want to. <laughs> yeah. And then they come back and they still have the same problems. So you just keep nagging and nagging yeah. and nagging. And eventually, as they get older, it seems like things begin to take care of themselves a little bit if, they, if they're really seriously wanting to play. And otherwise, there's not a lot you can do about it. <laughs> they just... Yeah they go home and they, they don't practice right. And, and you're not there to tell them they're, that you're not, they're not practicing. Right. So you're just stuck. That's one of the things I really like about like all this community that Facebook um, allows to happen with the groups, because it's like, you know, they have questions throughout the week and they can post their questions, you know, of them actually playing. And then they have all this feedback of, you know, of teachers being able to give them more tips and, Students, you know, encouraging them, motivating them, because, yeah, it's like what I notice a lot is like it's not just a, a technical thing, but also a mind thing. You know, they could, you know, come to the lesson, but then on day two after the lesson, they're getting discouraged, you know, or they're like, you know, I can't do this. And they quit or, you know, that for that week or they don't come another week and then they, you know, off track. So. So, yeah, I love the social aspect of Facebook, what it what it sort of does, you know, to help students with that problem. That would be an advantage. But I, I like uh, Howard, I like to walk around and see every little angle and every little thing. And uh, that, that's, while I was watching here on the beginners, they, they, they held their hands up with their bow hold. But are they still doing that when they go home? <laughs> 
or when they're not on here. I mean, they people get lazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of people, I mean, they do uh, private lessons, but then they, they're integrated in a, um, in a group online. So it's, it's mm -hmm. sort of nice they could have both of those, you know, where they could get that um, personal touch of a good instructor. And then um, they might be a part of two or three other groups that are encouraging them and motivating them. So that's a nice combination, I think. The ones that are taking violin in school do much better. Because mm -hmm. I think they see a teacher every day, and that's pretty nice. Yeah, anything to get them, you know, to not just be by themselves, you know, as much as possible, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, or just orchestra in itself can sort of not be enough, I've, I've found over the years, you know. I have, like, people that come to me um, after years of not having private instruction, and then they're, you know, they've been in orchestra, but, you know, they haven't had that personal touch of the, the yeah. technique. So, and I know. think working together, and I work together with the orchestra teachers in this area, and, and it, it's, it's helping a lot. Yeah, um, that's that's why I love sectional training, you know, just for, for um, teachers to open that up and and have, you know, that, you know, more um, advice come in from a professional teacher. I think that's really good. You, yeah, you do well, sectional training? It's actually sweet because the, the, the teacher at the Music Magnet School here in Akron is in my orchestra also. <laughs> nice. So I have help there. So I have a question. Uh, do you know what you plan for um, these meetings? One thing I'm interested in is, I guess, uh, um, my reluctance in teaching is I feel like I don't have the training to teach. <laughs> and part of that comes from my being um, instructor at a university teaching teachers, and they have to have certification yet there really isn't any instruction on how to teach. I just wondered if you plan to have a, a group like that. I think really that's, my, that's my reluctance. I could probably do all right, but I feel like I just don't have the information. <laughs> really, really glad you mentioned that. Um, I mean, like the more that I've, I've come back to um, teaching after not teaching for a year, after everything I've been through, I realize just how much I love it, how much how passionate I'm about teaching. And how there's it's a whole other art to it um, that's outside of playing, you know, actually helping people and guiding them to learn. Um, but yeah, I mean, my intention for like this group is not necessarily to be a teacher of teachers or anything else. Like I respect everybody that comes on here. I just want to have good discussions and just have it to where it's um, beneficial for everybody. So yeah, I guess just however it kind of you know develops. Um, but I thought it, would, it, was, it was a good idea to bring other people on that are professionals. And just kind of see how everybody interacts and and kind of go from there so but yeah I love the thought of that like just encouraging other teachers and um, giving them tips on you know not just from me but from other instructors you know that are um, that have experience uh, so it could just be a forum of that you know just discussion of um, you know ideas and, and encouragement just like you know students get encouragement from us teachers you know other teachers can encourage other teachers too you know so I think that's where this could this could be uh, used. Uh, one thing that uh, I would add to that for Mary Ann, um, I know how to play the violin and I know how to teach, but I have no credentials. I uh, I don't have a degree in music. I don't even have an associate's degree in music. Uh, I took private lessons for about twenty years. Um, but I did learn that the secret for effective teaching was to be 100% focused on what you're doing. Um, and, and I have had training in teaching other things. I teach technical short courses for programming languages. And I, I lead a uh, special interest group in the North Texas PC users group, which by the way, I use Zoom just like uh, Michael was using tonight. I have a professional account, um, and so I'm. I'm kind of, and I've done very well. Uh, and I've gone into joint recitals with other teachers who did have credentials, and I got feedback from some of the from the uh, parents and audience and friends out there in the audience that my students sounded better, and. Uh, 
I, I think that is entirely a factor of how much I focus on what I'm doing. It's a, it's, for me, it's a, f- a flow activity. If you know it, if you've heard of the word flow, it's a, <clears throat> it was a, there was a book uh, written about 30 years ago by a psychologist named Chinksit Mahali uh, called uh, Flow, the um, something, the, the psychology of optimal human experience. And I think that's, that's what uh, teaching violin lessons is for me. It's one thing that I have done for money and that I enjoy more than pretty much anything else I've done for money, including programming, which I do enjoy. That's great. Yeah, I, there was actually a post on um, the Violin Guild that I was contributing to. Um, somebody just kind of saying, you know, there's obviously – you know, the very good violinist, and then there's the really good teacher. And it was a really good discussion kind of comparing that. And yeah, I mean, there's so many things that from my experience that, that I would say and, and, and mention on there, like, you know, you know, adjusting the students and, and you know, because everybody's different in how they learn and, and what motivates them. You know, so like you have your you have some students that, you know, just need encouragement and just need to be, um, you know, given advice based on, you know, like not quitting, you know, just not being discouraged, like, you know, somebody just get overwhelmed and they just need the vision. They need the vision of where they're at and where they're going, you know, like so many um, teachers don't give that. And what they have to do is they have to feel out the student, like, where are you trying to go? Where are you, where are you feeling like you're being um, barricaded, you know, and then giving them that vision that, okay, if you just get to this point, then you're going to see this. And then if you get to this point, you're going to see this. But it's like kind of giving them that, that full picture lets them feel more encouraged. I mean, there's a whole other element to teaching and getting somebody to, from point A to point B, in my opinion, that's different than um, just being good at the violin. You know, like I could play and I could be the best player in the world, but if, you know, if the student is, is demotivated or if they're not sure of themselves or where they're going, they're going to quit, you know, and they might make excuses. They might say, oh, I'm busy. I can't make lessons this week or, you know, but we're, really what they're telling you is that you're not teaching them properly. You're not giving them encouragement and motivation and you're not being a good model to where, you know, you're going or giving them ideas, you know, like you might, some teachers might have such a strict model of teaching. They do it the same way for every student that they have this unique situation and that student, it just doesn't fit for their type of learning, you know, ability. So, you know, and there's so many different types of, I'm sure you can relate to this choice, like so many different types of personalities and people. You know, you have some students that, you know, just want to have their hand held. You know, you have some that really want to make it into a certain orchestra or, or symphony. So you have to kind of teach a different way, you know, give them a certain type of uh, style, you know. Or you have some that are like, you know, just, you know, want to feel like they're, you know, being, you know, taught properly and just, you know, learning the right music, you know. Or, you know, they, they might be kind of stuck on classical, but, you know, a, teach, a good teacher feels out that they need to have some more fun, right? So, like, suggesting, like, a certain little book for them to learn or suggesting a certain um, style that they may, maybe never have tried. You know, just feeling out that they're a little bit demotivated and they need a little bit of a change. You know, like, you know, if you just keep them on the same book, the same method, the same things, you know, they're, they're going to feel, you know, like, ah, uh, here it goes again. This is all the same, all the same, but changing it up. You know, so a good teacher will change based on the student and what they hear. You know, I, I feel like there's a lot to be said about all that. You know, what's your thoughts, Joyce? Um, I like to use a reward of, of like a piece of music that they really, really wanted to learn as getting them to play etudes. You play your etudes and I'll, I'll give you this wonderful piece of music over here. And they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll turn themselves inside out to get, you know a piece of rock and roll or something (laughs) or a piece from a video game. They love that stuff. Little kids do anyway. Some are are really motivated by that. Yeah. Yeah. They really are. Some of them and others. I found that if you project not only a hundred percent attention, but project confidence Mm -hmm. that they'll, they'll respect you enough to want to learn from you. And the parents do too. One of the uh, most valuable tips I ever got from another instructor was to always carefully watch the student for whenever they, and especially beginning students, uh, whenever they do something right, 
pounce on that say, whoa, that was really good. Mm -hmm. And uh, they react. I have all of my students react very well to that. Yes, they do. Tell them what they did right first and then try to fix what wasn't quite right. <laughs> I totally agree with that. That's, that would be like one of the first things I would teach about teaching is that, you know, presentation and communicating to the student, um, how to improve is huge. So, I mean, the, the way that I do it is I always give, like you said, Joyce, a positive encouragement all the time. Um, something, it doesn't even matter how bad they play or how good they play, something good. And then I always give that sort of the first thing, like the first thing that they hear, and then I'll and then, then I'll give them a suggestion, you know, of something. But I always make it seem like it's just a suggestion. It's not that you're doing it really bad, you're doing it really good. It's just like it's just the same sort of structure, you know. So for example, you know, um, like why, like let's say a, a player that really struggles, like he's you know just has all these bad habits. You know, the wrist is is in, and and the fingers are low, and and the intonation's off. You know, I'll, I'll say, you know, yeah, it seems like you're doing a really good job, you know, with, um, with practicing this week. Like I can see some improvement in that thumb. You know, there's some good things going on here. Like, this, like really good job. I can really tell. Um, and then really casually, you know, just, you know, I really highly recommend that, you know, make sure to get that wrist straight. You know, these are the reasons for that. You know, I highly recommend, you know, maybe doing this drill to, to work on that to improve. Um, and then whenever you keep to that structure, it, it constantly doesn't ever threaten them, you know, because they, people can feel threatened, you know, if, if you're just giving them everything they're doing wrong. Like if you say, you know, yeah, okay, let me go through it. Um, the wrist is like this. The thumb is like this. The knuckles are really low. You know, this is why you can't do that. And boom, boom, boom. And just keep going negative, negative, negative. Sure. Technically what you're telling them is true, but it's not, you know, encouraging, right? Well, the first thing I tell them, or one of the first things I tell them when they come in for lessons and they're inevitably very nervous is you're here to make mistakes yeah. so that I can help you fix them. Otherwise, you don't even need me. <laughs> That's a really great way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had my, my uh, current student was, oh, but I'm afraid I might make a mistake. Make a big one. <laughs> yeah, Got to make a mistake? Yeah, make, make it as big and, and obvious as possible. Then we can go work on it and fix it. Yeah. Uh, makes it easier. Yeah. And like when I hear something like that, like you just said that, Howard, it's like now I'm more comfortable, you know, to, to just, you know, be myself, you know, and, and, you know, that I, I'm dealing with that all the time with my students online. Like they're always uh, timid uh, because of how they're playing. You know, they're, they, you know, a lot of them are perfectionists, you know, they want to play better. Like they might, they might have, you know, they might be really good at another instrument or they might have been teachers in their past or, or whatever. And, you know, they understand if they're not doing it right. So, like, that's insecure, they have insecurity about that. So, if you just, yeah, like you just said there, just make it real casual, like, fun. Like, come on. Like, of course you're going to make mistakes. Of course you're going to mess up. Like, I'm ready to hear them. I'm ready to, you know, give you some good suggestions, you know. There was another thing I had from a, a student several years ago. Uh, she came to me and, and I said, okay, I want you to play, play this part. But, but that's hard. I said, oh, of no. course it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's hard. You, know, you didn't really expect it to be easy, did you? I mean, if it was easy, anybody could do it. You know, I'm going to ask you to do hard things. And a couple of months later, she came home with a, or she came into the lesson with a, a, uh, a critique sheet that she had gotten in her solo contest at school. And, and it had all kinds of things. She got a Division I rating, and, and it said, great tone and great technique and I looked at that and it says how did that make you feel you know that was hard wasn't it how did that make your daddy feel how did it make me feel <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably the the biggest thing I would say that I tell students as far as encouragement that really helps I would say in general that's a you know a tip or whatever um, I always give them the perspective of two steps forward one step back Okay, so, and this applies, it really, it's really true. It applies to, on a day-to-day -day basis, it applies weekly basis and monthly basis, okay? So, if a student's having a bad day, I always explain it, like, okay, you're always going to have two good days, and then you're going to have a bad day. It's just part of the process. You know, I've been playing for 28 years, and I'm still dealing with this, you know, with, with my playing. You know, what, it's like if you relate to them, like, where you're at, where they want to be, and, and they're still, they're dealing with it, and you're dealing with it, it's sort of like, oh, 
you know, I guess that's normal. You know, it's not, it's not just that I'm bad at this instrument. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, and then also I, I explain it, like I said, on a week to week basis, because students really will just have a terrible week. Right. So two weeks forward, one week back. And then I wrote in a post recently that you'll even have a bad month, you know, so be prepared for a bad month. And I explained it that, you know, students quit the violin because they get into that bad month and they just think that it's over. Like they just can't do this. They're just not cut out for the violin. So if you explain it in that way that, you know, that vision, teaching is all about vision, I feel like, because if you give them that vision, then they're like, okay, well, that's just what Michael said. I'm having a bad month. Now I'm ready for the next month. Right. So then they stick with it. Cause I, I think that's like the biggest thing with, with playing violin is its longevity. You have to stick with it, you know, I mean, because you're going to have bad times. You have to give the students that vision. Otherwise, they're, they're potentially going to get discouraged and quit. And there's so many that do that or quit based on not having that vision. So that's, that's kind of, I think probably the biggest tip I would give is having that, giving them that mentality because they're always going to have struggling times. Marianne, any, th- any thoughts on that? Everything that you've been talking about is how I teach anyway. I always, uh, we do our discussions. Uh, at the, the main part of the class that I, classes that I teach are discussions. And every response, I respond to everybody. Every response, I start with something good. Sometimes it's challenging to find something that was, because if the discussion was totally wrong. But I always find something. And I, I, I try to make at least half the discussion about that, and then I'll go over a few things to change. But I never start with everything. I only start with the important things, you know. So, I mean, those are all things that you've talked about. That's exactly how I teach. And being in- encouraging, I think, is my philosophy. That's the main thing that I do, mm-hmm. because these are people who are just starting their master's program in psychology, and they're intimidated by the whole idea of being in grad school. So they don't know if they can make it. So I always, I'm, and being encouraging, I think is the main point that I try to get across and being positive and telling them what they're doing right. And so. I think the biggest um, thing that you can have as a teacher, the biggest skill, biggest muscle is listening. I, I believe that so much. If you listen to what they say and not just like the words, but how they're saying it and how they're feeling. You know, how a student's feeling, you know, like you can just tell when a student is um, more, you know, energetic and they're happy and they're, they're on a good road and they're, you know, or, I mean, you can tell if a student comes in for a lesson, you can just tell like they're discouraged and something isn't going right and they're not happy. And, and like, you have to be able to tell if they're on the verge of like shacking up and quitting, you know, they, they're not going to tell you that, you know, but you have to feel that out. You know, if they're on the verge of quitting, everything has to change in how you teach them. You can't just go back to, you can't just go to the routine of, you know, all right, let's go through our scales, let's go through our E2, let's go through our our pieces. Like, you have to know that that's what's on the verge, and that's all you focus on during that lesson, because that's what's most important is for them to stick with it. So you have to feel that out, you know, and they're not always going to tell you exactly what they're feeling. You have to be able to sort of tell, you know, based on how they're saying things. I think it's important to check it out. How do you think you're doing every so often? I think that's very important, especially considering people quit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like an example I would give, like if a student just auditioned and they didn't make it in and and they're just like, yeah, I just, I kind of just feel like I didn't get in because I didn't really practice as much as I should. And I'm just kind of not really getting it, you know, like if they're giving you that vibe, you know what I mean? Like, you know, at that point where you have to really encourage them and give them vision and, and good positive feedback, you know, tell them everything they did great with the audition, you know, how they got to a certain point. And I really thought that you were going to, you know, potentially get in, but you know, you know, there's always next time, you know, there's always another opportunity, you know, just giving them some of that feedback, you know, that they're not maybe going to get when they walk out of the audition room, you know? So Howard, any thoughts? Oh, from, uh, I, I find that the, Motivation is less of a factor for my younger students than it is for my older students. Um, Agree. The the adults come to me, uh, and I I've gotten to where I don't expect an adult student to last more than six months. Uh, they they encounter the first really hard spot and they give up, and the students just keep coming back and keep 
uh, the younger students just keep coming back and, and doing it. And sometimes they get a little motivation from their parents or, or they just expect to do that. And eventually they get really good. Yeah, the, uh, yeah I, I'm glad you said that because, yeah, the adults are – it's all managing the mind to the adults. I mean, I have so many adults over age 60 that started with me. Um, at one point when I was teaching um, 70 or 75 students, um, about 30% of those students were over age 60, and they started from scratch. Um, so it, it's literally all, like, mind management because a, a, student, a student that's over 60 typically, they're very disciplined. They're very, they're paying for the lessons they have, you know, they want to improve, you know, they're going to be technical, they're going to do what the teacher tells them because they've been around, you know, you know, that if the teacher is giving them advice, you, you should follow the advice and this is what you should do. They're not going to be like working on, like, you know, some other student, the, the opposite side is like the, the student that goes on YouTube and they just want to learn songs. They don't want to learn technical parts of violin, right? So a student that's 60 that comes for lessons, they're mostly a technical student. So yeah, um, typically with that, I mean, it's managing the mind. It's it's giving them the vision because they they feel like they're they're at a disadvantage compared to um, a kid. And honestly, that I don't believe in that. I believe that if a student has proper mechanics with violin, that they're going to be able to learn in the same way, the same rate as somebody that's younger. I, I give them that vision because I I believe it to be true. I've seen students over age sixty that you know have had that mentality that I I really convince them or show them that it really is proper mechanics and okay yeah you've been trying to play the violin in this way for the last year and the reason why you're struggling is because you're just not doing it quite as as proper but I mean if you just make some adjustments you're at the same level as somebody that's young you know so if they bring that up to you about the young young students you know that's sort of that thing that's going on in their brain when they're practicing and, and learning all the time you have to really give them that vision that it's not about age you know, that's that's what I've seen over the years, that that's really important. Once you get that out of their mind, I feel like, though, and a lot of, a few other things, it's sort of they're at the same level. And then I think they actually have an advantage because they're disciplined. They're there to learn. You know, they don't have distractions. They have more time, you know. So, like, I, I've, I, I like to make them feel actually like they're at an, at an advantage. I really think that they are. And um, it's worked for me over the years to help them with the longevity of, of learning and, and continuing with it. I went to a, a music jam um, here in Nashville. I don't know if I should say where it was. And there were, it was a very large group, uh, old time music, old time fiddle music. And I think there were like eight fiddlers and I looked at their bow hands and their hand position um, was half of them were like this. <laughs> oh, okay. That, I just, all I could do technique. to keep my mouth shut. Don't say anything. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you're not their teacher. <laughs> I wanted to say something. You know why you're having some trouble. It's because you're bending your wrist. Uh, another funny anecdote was uh, I went to a workshop with Jay Unger. Have you ever seen him play? Of course. He, he holds his violin like this, and he has his wrist entirely up against the, the fiddle. <laughs> he has the, the, the worst technique out of anybody that plays wonderfully. By the way, he's like he the plays best so player. well. Bad technique. He's like and the I, worst I kept, nightmare of what I want a student to see. I kept wanting <laughs> to ask him if he had carpal tunnel or something, because <laughs> he's holling the violin so horribly. It's it gave me the willies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we can all agree that you know having good fundamental technique is so important and. And having a student in person is obviously an advantage to that. And, um, you know, yeah, I mean, like, just setting them up for success. You know, if you don't set them up for success, they don't know necessarily what success is, what it takes. But that's where the teachers, that's their job as a teacher. Um, I'm sure you, Joyce, have um, mastered that over the years, teaching so many students, you know, how, how important it is to, to have that, you know, that vision of technique, you know, and just making sure that they're on the right track. That gives them that advantage, you know, compared to if they're just an orchestra and they don't have that, you know, being able to learn it the right way. And you know, I find efficiency is so much more, it's so much better when a student is set up with a perfect fundamental base. You know, like I, the way I explain it is if you have, okay, if you start learning, like the first couple of lessons, we're emphasizing technique like crazy and just making sure everything's set up properly. I'm like a, a bulldog trying to get them to have that perfect technique because if they have it, 
their progress is like this, with the violin. It's like this. Okay, if you have bad habits, things that you're not doing properly, your progress is like this, even like this, if you have enough bad habits. So, like, a lot of people think that if they play five hours a day, you know, they're going to get better if they have bad technique, and that's not the case. You know, so I emphasize to a lot of students, and this also helps their encouragement, is um, you don't have to practice two hours a day or an hour a day. You just have to practice properly. You have to just work on things the right way. Some of my best students are ones that only practice a half hour a day, but they have great technique and they do it consistently every single day. They are doing wonderful with the violin. So, like, I give them a vision because a lot of people feel like they are not good because they just don't put the time in. That's, that's what they, they feel like is the case, and that's just not, you know. So, um, but yeah, Joyce, you can relate to that. I mean, just technique, it's so important for them to have the, the perfect fundamental base, you know. Exactly. Uh, you, you, can, you can spot the self-taught fiddlers fairly easily in performance. Now, some of them play great, but if you cut off their little finger, they wouldn't notice. And <laughs> they never get yeah, out of first great. position. Uh. So it's like they only have three fingers, and it's only first position, and that's it. But they play wonderfully. Yeah, I always try to fix that. I was, I'm, I'm very, um, yeah. When it comes to fourth fingers, I do not want them to have that bad habit of playing open strings for everything. That's not acceptable. <laughs> well, my current student, I'm about, I'm about to get into some heavy. Uh, fourth finger training and she's almost ready for uh positions um i i've been discouraging her from uh vibrato i say as soon as you can reliably shift back and forth between first and third position then we work on vibrato uh i just don't want you to use vibrato to cover up intonation problems <laughs> nice so, um, yeah, I, first of all, I just want to say um, thank you guys for coming tonight. I really enjoyed this discussion. Um, I feel like you guys are all good teachers, and that's really cool to just be on a call with four good teachers. Um, so I first want to say that. And, um, yeah, I, I hope that other people that are watching this, I will, I mean, I'm recording it, um, out there will join us, you know, next week Sunday at um, 7. Yeah, we'll, you know, plan on that each week. And yeah, I really like the thought of just having great discussion related to this topic. You know, there's so much to be said about how to get students to, to practice and be motivated. And, you know, from the teacher, teacher's perspective, too, just to keep a studio going, right? I mean, just to have successful situations with students and parents, you know, and, and, and helping them achieve their goals, you know. So, like, whatever we can do as teachers to do that, um, the more success rate, you know, we can give to, to students the better, you know, because what the worst thing that can happen is, you know, a student starts, they have that passion for learning, that interest, that excitement. You guys have experienced and seen it multiple times. And then they just quit because they're not guided properly or something comes up. So like, that's like the worst scenario. They buy a violin and then they're, you know, the violin sits in the closet, collects dust, right? You know, so like, if we can do whatever we can to, to prevent that, you know, so yeah, I love, I love just being able to talk more about some stuff like this, and um, I hope you guys will join us again next week. Um, anything uh, else I'll you guys want a, to say? I'll put an entry on my calendar. Uh, I think I can make it most Sundays. There'll be a few that i would be traveling. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll record every one of these, and I'll put it on the, um, the Facebook. I just started a new Facebook group for uh, professionals. So uh, I don't know if you guys are a part of that yet, but um, I, I'm going to send an email out probably tomorrow with um, this recording and information about um, the, the group. But yeah, that, I just I just saw that and I signed up for your group. So okay. uh, I, I'm doing less and less on Facebook because it it seems to be mostly a waste of time. <laughs> actually. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm way too addicted. <laughs> I'm on. OK. A like nonstop. Like, I mean, I'm like doing my whole life on Facebook. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to figure out if it's, if it's way too much of a bad thing or how much of a bad thing. Cause I still have to exercise and do all that stuff, I think. Right. But <laughs> I think if that, I'm going to be active on anything, I'll get back into doing YouTube videos. There you go. There you go. It's, it's fun. I mean, Facebook has it so to where like, 
you know, it's, it's, you're on top of everything. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but like if you're talking and you start a thread or if you're commenting, like if somebody comments on that, it will pop up right on your screen. Like it just, it's so efficient, you know, and, and you just like be on there all day, you know, and, you know, I don't know. Obviously they know what they're doing, but, um, but yeah, it, uh, I find it as a good place to encourage students and, and, and be a, um, you know, just uh, somebody that can help others, you know, um, posting stuff. And uh, Marianne, I appreciate your participation with uh, with the other groups. Um, we're encur we're trying to encourage adult learners um, through another group, and Marianne's been helping out with that. So a um, lot of you know newbies and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, I really appreciate you guys. Uh, let me give you guys a code for being here for my contest. Uh, some of you guys found me from that um, avenue, and if you um, get code you'll be able to watch um, or get 25 entries and then if you come live you get 100 entries so I'm going to give uh, the code for the um, for the recording for the 25 so if you guys are watching this uh, after the fact so it's going to be um, let's see what's the code here it's going to be uh, pro Rogers um, so like pro professional PRO and then R O D G ERS Pro Rogers. If you put that into um, my contest, you'll get 25 entries. And then for the people that are here right now, there's going to be a, a five numbers that go in um, in front of that that will give you the hundred. So I'm going to go ahead and post that in the chat for for the three of you guys. But yeah, if you're watching after the fact, Pro Rogers is the 25 entries. And that's P R O R O D G. E R S. Pro Rogers. And uh, you're gonna you're gonna send the uh, five number code. Sure, I'm. Um, yeah, I'm gonna put that right in um, right now. I don't think people that are watching the recording can see that. So that's the oh, uh, for the hundred. Oh, okay. I s I'm seeing zero. Oh, don't, don't, say don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. I'm not showing up you, unless you want everybody to get your entry or you know to. Oh, uh, show it! Show it again. I didn't. I didn't catch all of it. Yeah, it's on the side there. So yeah, that's the advantage to coming live. So if you guys are watching this right now, um, I encourage you guys to come next week Sunday at seven because then you can um, have more entries for the bow contest I'm doing on the nineteenth. Um, giving away Luger silver bow worth a thousand bucks. They're really nice bows, and anybody that um, plays violin can find massive benefits from these bows. So I'm giving I'd have a bow. Yeah. If I got that, I'd have a bow that's worth more than my fiddle. <laughs> hey, I'm sure you wouldn't complain about that if you were to win, that is. So, um, so yeah, thank you guys for coming. Um, any final words? Uh, I, like I said, I really appreciate you guys being here. I hope you guys enjoyed the discussion and the time. Very good. Good night. Good night. Great. Good night. Nice okay. to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> Nice to meet you guys. Hope to see more next week um, and hope to see you guys again. Cool. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye.